Okay. Uh, hello all and welcome to 17th session of SIMA. So today we are going to uh, talk about Salesforce Revenue Cloud and industry, Industries Cloud. And uh, this is SIMA leadership team. We have Neha, Lilith and myself. Also we have got two advisory uh, uh, architects from leadership team that is Gaurav and Johan. Both of them are not able to join today's call unfortunately. And today's session, like I mentioned, is about Salesforce Revenue Cloud and Industries Cloud. And we have got two uh, actually well-known speakers and very uh, uh, SME on the subjects, actually, Suraj and Georgi. Suraj is senior Salesforce architect at Salesforce for Revenue Cloud. He is having almost 13 years of experience in Salesforce platform, and he has done more than 35 CPQ implementation already. So I'm sure we are going to get benefited from the current session. And the next speaker is Georgi, but unfortunately he is not able to join the session live. So his session is recorded already and he, uh, Suresh will be helping us to play that session for us. Uh, Georgi is also having almost 10 years of experience in the Salesforce ecosystem. He is a senior program architect and CTA at Salesforce. And the other interesting thing about Georgi is that he is almost having 35 Salesforce certifications, which is really great. And uh, myself, Mira, I am currently working as a Salesforce architect at USD Trivandrum. I'm a Salesforce MVP, and I'm actually preparing for CTA also. That's about me. So a little overview about this group and what we would like to achieve. So we would like to support each other in preparing for the technical architect certification by creating and sharing content that helps to prepare for the certification. So if you have got any additional ideas on like how we can make this group better, or if you would like to see some additional topics as part of SEMA group, uh, please share your thoughts with us and we will try to implement that as part of our SEMA team. Some housekeeping, uh, housekeeping rules, I'm sure like you all are aware about this, like while uh, during the session, please keep yourself muted and you can share all your questions on chat and towards the end of the session, we will be uh, taking each of the question and Suresh will try to answer those questions. And like expected, like, you know, we all are not perfect, neither do we know everything. So if you spot a mistake, please do let us know. We can update that. And uh, if you are interested in hosting or presenting, please reach out to us and all are welcome to uh, present as part of SIMA. Without further delay, I would like to hand it over to Suresh. So Suresh, let me make you as the host. Sure, no problems. Thanks, thanks Mira. Great. I will share my screen. Um, sure. Okay. Uh, are you seeing my presentation now? Hopefully, yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Vera, for uh, uh, the warm welcome. And um, you know, um, hi everybody. I'm I'm Suraj. Uh, I'm a senior success architect uh, here at Salesforce, um, based out of Sydney, Australia. Um, and um, um, you know. Uh, Great opportunity. I've heard of Saima quite a lot. Uh, you know, never never thought that I would actually get the opportunity to to present to all of you. Uh, you know, and 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 I'm 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 nowhere as competent as as uh, you know as this group is. You know, there's a lot of budding CTAs and you know technical architects, uh, etc. Um, you know, I'm 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 here to kind of share a little bit of knowledge that I have uh, on Revenue Cloud. Um, you know. Um, been been in the space for about uh, seven years and and been in the Salesforce uh, space like Mira said for about 14, 14 odd years, uh, you know. So I've kind of seen um, the evolution of what we call Revenue Cloud, which is your Salesforce CPQ and billing, uh, starting from two thousand and twelve when it was used to be called Invoice IT. Um, you know, it became Steelbrick, got acquired by Steelbrick, and then Steelbrick got acquired by. Uh, by Salesforce and became Salesforce CPQ and billing and all that. So uh, just want to shed some light. It's it's going to be super high level. Um, 
I, I I know that you know this this group really wants to get into the technical details, but uh, unfortunately, you know, compressing all of this into uh, into forty odd minutes is very difficult. Um, you know, if if you guys are interested in Salesforce CPK and billing, I'm happy to kind of run more sessions. Uh, you know, I've already told Mira maybe uh, probably the next one we can even think of doing a demo or something of that sort. Uh, but for now, we'll kind of keep it high level at thirty thousand feet high level, and. Uh, uh, explain some of the uh, you know top features of um, Salesforce CPQ and billing. Um, moving on, uh, uh, Safe Harbor. Um, you know there is there is uh, I have to call this out because there is a feature that I'm going to be uh, calling out as a part of the session. Um, you know. Please make your uh, purchasing decisions based on what's uh, generally available at this point in time, and do not rely on uh, a roadmap. Uh, but uh, at the same time, uh, you know um, uh, there is something that I'll be I'll be talking to you all about in some time. So uh, this is the safe harbor is actually very relevant. Um, cool. Um, not getting into the details of who I am. I already spoke about that. Uh, been in the space for quite some time, and uh, uh, essentially, as a senior success architect, uh, you know, just a little bit about my role. Uh, uh, you know, um, in particular, um, I'm I'm actually responsible for the success of Salesforce CPQ and billing or Revenue Cloud, rather, um, for the entire APAC, which includes uh, ANZ, uh, ASEAN, the South Asian Southeast Asian countries, and and India. Um, so I'm 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 a pretty hands-on uh, person, uh, and I kind of deal with a lot of strategic customers as a part of my role, um, and and ensuring that Salesforce CPQ and billing implementations are all successful. So that's uh, that's essentially what I what I do here. Um, joined Salesforce in in November, so it's not been too long. Uh, worked for a lot of partners, you know, here in in Australia, um, India, US, you know. Uh, so so kind of know the partner ecosystem really well. Um, so yeah, so that's that's me. Um, uh, from an agenda standpoint, uh, what we have today is uh, kind of giving you a high-level idea about what uh, you know Salesforce CPQ and billing is. Um, you know what what are some of the uh, uh, key capabilities that uh, you know the package has. You know it's a managed package. You know what 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 it's uh, what it's got and how what's the kind of value that uh, that you can get out of uh, you know the the package. Um, but I will also kind of explain the high level uh, data model as we call it a unified uh, you know unified kind of a data model is what we call it. we'll will I'll touch on that um, not going to go very very deep into it but then you know I will try to touch uh, some of those key key aspects key objects and all that um, I will also explain you know what are some of the challenges uh, you know uh, that customers would usually have and kind of related to use cases also so kind of talk about what these what those important use cases are starting off by talking about the challenges and how it can solve those problems um i'll also touch base on uh, what are some of the main implementation approaches that we have when we talk about salesforce cpq and billing that is definitely very relevant uh, you know if you, if you are actually thinking about embarking on a salesforce cpq and billing implementation journey and um, i'll also talk about some unique use cases uh, you know where you can actually connect some third party applications uh, you know along uh, to to salesforce cpq uh, to revenue cloud and uh, last but not the least i'll probably end this by talking about what are the enablement tracks that we have uh, and uh, how each of you can kind of get started on your uh, cpq journey if you haven't already started um moving on um so like i said earlier we are talking about the whole product to cash uh you know being on a single platform right so um, uh, the key point here is to um, you know, to in order to actually adopt uh, or adapt uh, new strategies, you actually need to bring this entire product to cash onto a single platform, and at the same time, you try to connect it to all the touch points. Um, in 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 the in the code to cash space, you actually call it the monetization ecosystem. Uh, what do you what do you mean by monetization ecosystem? Um, essentially, you know, we are talking about uh, getting a you know a prospect as a lead into Salesforce and bring taking it all the way. Uh, you know, till the end, where you actually convert that into an account, you actually get cash out of that out of that customer, and at the same time, you're actually able to connect. Uh, you know, that single the, the platform that we have to different different uh, external systems, which will take care of uh, you know things like revenue recognition, uh, or or you know an ERP or or an accounting system or whatever. So uh, the 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 revenue cloud um, 
pla- considering the fact that it's actually built on the salesforce platform it actually allows us to uh, to connect to any any systems uh, irrespective of the fact that it's it's internal or you know uh, it's it's an it's an out out you know it's an external system so um, essentially with revenue cloud you can actually simplify you can actually consolidate and you can bring all of these uh, uh, you know product to cash and uh, revenue management systems all of that uh, into that uh, you know and 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 any any critical touch points which are there you know you can bring all of that into that customer journey and obviously you know the main thing about salesforce is the customer 360 um, you know uh, methodology right so you you actually have the customer at the center of the revenue life cycle and you can actually grow uh, you know the customer can actually grow their business uh, using a product catalog you know you have your price book um, and and at the same time it actually works across every channel so uh, and irrespective of the revenue model you can actually uh, uh, you know grow the the grow your business by keeping the customer at the center so that's the that's the main thing about having the product to cash on a single platform now obviously uh, along with this because you einstein you got your ai capabilities and your uh, analytics uh, using tableau or einstein analytics uh, you know you can you can think about uh, you know going the next level by thinking about uh discount guidance or you know product recommendation um you could even think about uh, a, a scenario where you pay as you go where you you actually have a self service uh capability which i'll talk about in some time um so there's this you know the 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 amount of uh, uh what can i say um uh, you know capabilities that you can actually integrate uh to to revenue cloud is endless uh, so you know you can think about whatever you want to and you can actually connect all of that into into salesforce cpq and billing uh using you know using a middleware or uh you know uh, or or a good uh, esb uh and the most important thing that we usually connect to is an erp so you can actually see that you know there is uh, there is erp at the bottom uh where you you actually have your general ledger you actually have your uh, supply chain your inventory so depending on the kind of customer that you're dealing with so your customers can be a manufacturing company it can be a subscription company uh depending on that you know uh, your erp can actually manage different different or handle different different purposes um so that's that's the reason why you actually have your erp at the bottom and um, everything else so it can be a one time sale it can be a perpetual uh, you know license uh, milestone based billing consumption i'll talk about usage uh, uh, based uh, billing in some time so all of that uh, is very much possible um moving on uh, the next one we have is um you know just talking about sales for cpq uh, in general so um at the end of the day uh, uh, what we are talking about from when, when we say revenue cloud right now there is sales for cpq and there sales for billing so i'll start with sales for cpq what sales for cpq is um sales for cpq helps us in in uh you know um, it gives you greater efficiency and uh, you know your the win rates are higher there is increased revenue growth all of that um and obviously with sales for cpq you can actually help the sales rep in finding the right products by using a very step by step you know configuration thing which you call the quote line editor um so it helps in picking and choosing the right solution based on uh you know what the customer actually wants so um like i said earlier there is a there is a capability called uh product recommendation so you can actually build uh, a capability into revenue cloud which will help the sales rep in finding out what product the customer would actually potentially buy so you can build that level of ai based logic into it um and at the end of the day we are talking about increasing customer satisfaction and you know increasing the trust level and all that and uh, the most important thing using a tool like uh, salesforce epic is to ensure that the quotes that you generate are actually accurate and um, you know we 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 can avoid any kind of errors that actually happen from configuring so for example when you're using an excel sheet uh there is high chances that you know you 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 might uh, probably plug in a price which is not accurate because you might be copying and pasting the price from somewhere else and that actually leads to an incorrect price so at the end of the day when you send the quote to the customer and the customer is not really happy or the customer is actually raising questions um or or internally if the finance team is actually coming back and asking questions around you know why is there uh, you know a margin problem here and if you go down and when you drill down you actually see that the price you actually copied is wrong you know that's that can be a problem but when you use something like it can be salesforce cpq or any cpq for that matter but you know focusing on salesforce cpq using those product rules and price rules you can make sure that uh, you know every code that we send out of the of out of the out of the system is is accurate and uh, you know one with almost zero errors 
Um, and and on top of this, you're also talking about having workflows like approval processes. So you have a package called the advanced approval package, which will help in you know building concurrent approvals, parallel approvals, uh, ensuring that the codes are are even more accurate. So discounts are not applied. So uh, you know customers cannot cherry pick and actually apply. Uh, you know ask you to apply discounts. So all your all your discounts are approved. So you got advanced approval to take care of that. Um, Apart from this, like I said earlier, you know when you when you actually talk about a subscription-based business and uh, you know usage-based business, uh, uh, you know billing is becoming more and more common, right? So uh, gone are the days where you know you buy only licenses, but usage-based billing is getting more important. So uh, usage and consumption, subscription, even milestone-based billing, all of that you know can be uh, can be done using CPQ. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, you're also talking about your sales leaders actually getting a, a very unified, uh, you know, a full view of uh, what's actually going on with your uh, revenue pipeline. Uh, so that includes your uh, current deals, any any renewal opportunities. So renewal uh, rate and your churn is extremely important from a customer success standpoint. So um, again, uh, Salesforce EPQ helps that quite a lot. Um, the example, the use case that we have over here is, uh, is Google Cloud. So uh, Google Cloud is a huge uh, Salesforce CPQ uh, customer and a very successful uh, customer. So as uh, I mentioned here, uh, you know there's there's been 83% uh, reduction in you know uh, uh, in in total sales order validation. So which means um, you know for for an order to actually go out of your of your door, you know there's there's uh, there's there's a lot of time actually has actually been saved in in validating if that order is is accurate. So that's that kind of relates to. Uh, you know what I mentioned earlier around quote accuracy and things like that. Um, there's also um, the capability to um, uh, contract amendments is an extremely important thing which I'll be talking about in some time. Um, and uh, you know the renewal process can also be automated, etc. So uh, quite a lot is possible. Um, moving to the next one is uh, is Salesforce billing. Um, again, this this I've, I've already touched base on you know what you can do with CPQ. Salesforce billing is an extension uh, of uh, the CPQ package and it's on the same platform. So if you're not using something like Salesforce billing, you are talking about connecting Salesforce CPQ to, uh, to an accounting system or an ERP, which makes things a little more harder because then you're talking about an integration. And uh, usually for something like Salesforce CPQ, we would want to have an enterprise level ESB in place uh, or a middleware in place. You know, we, uh, a point to point or, uh, you know, uh, an integration without without a middleware can, because there's a lot of data transformation that's required. So uh, to avoid all of that, we can actually have Salesforce billing also on the same platform. And at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's actually access to data quite easily. So um, you generate a quote over here and uh, within, within a couple of minutes, you can actually, uh, let's say the customer is actually happy with it. You know, you can generate an invoice, uh, you know, uh, you know, in, 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 in the uh, very, very quickly. Right. So um, it can be all the approval processes, the generation of the, the order and the generation of the invoices happen very quickly. So uh, Salesforce billing actually helps in, uh, you know, in taking care of that. Apart from that, uh, you know, Salesforce billing, having and ensuring that the billing uh, system is also on the same platform um, will, will, will help in giving that customer 360 degree view. So um, understanding what the customer has bought, has this customer been paying their bills on time, um, you know, uh, and let's say a sales rep is actually trying to sell to a customer, uh, you know, who's actually got a lot of, uh, uh, you know, um, debt and they haven't really paid their bills on time. So are we in a position to actually sell and build some automation around that? So things of that, form, uh, you know, th that level of automation becomes really easy when you actually have billing on the same platform. Um, there are some other capabilities that, that I've called out here around consolidating invoicing, uh, you know, there are flexible payment terms. So, um, you know, net 60, sorry, net 30, net, 16 net 90 or you know it can be an invoice plan so there can be different ways by which customers can actually pay um, you know all of that automation can be built into there's quite a lot which is possible out of the box but you know even even through customization or automation using uh, you know the standard salesforce configurable uh, automation that flows etc you know we can we can achieve quite a lot um, there is uh, the last one that I've called out there is a collections uh, package uh, in 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 the USV actually called the Dunning package. So um, collections is not you know it's not it's not uh, uh, that capability is not there out of the box from Salesforce billing. But then you actually have packages which are available on the App Exchange free of cost, built by the Salesforce uh, lab itself, which you can connect to uh, Salesforce billing and build 
rules, build workflows in there, which will actually send out reminders to customers saying that, uh, you know, your, your invoice is up for payment. It can be, you know, you can configure it. Uh, and, and after the invoice due date is crossed, you actually keep sending reminders. So um, all of that can be automated without actually having a collections person going and knocking the door to the customer. So, um, you know, having it on the same platform makes, uh, uh, makes it very useful. Um, again, I've called out the name of a customer there, Gordian, who uh, uh, have actually seen their, uh, you know, revenue actually increase 125% year on year because they actually implemented uh, Salesforce billing. Um, the next one, uh, this is uh, the new thing that I was actually referring to. Uh, this was subscription management was announced uh, in Dreamforce 21. Um, at this point in time, I cannot give you more details because it's going to be GA only in summer 22, but uh, this is a real game changer. And uh, all this while we were speaking about Salesforce CPQ and billing. Now we are also talking about subscription management uh, coming into the picture. Essentially, subscription management is all about self-service. So uh, you have the capability of uh, connecting um, any 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 system. It can be it can be Salesforce CPQ and billing uh, to an external system, but it can it can also be a bespoke portal. It can be uh, Experience Cloud. Um, you know, it can be some homegrown system that you actually have built. Connect all of that to Salesforce using subscription management. So um, the 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 most uh, important. Uh, thing that's going to be coming in uh, in summer 22, um, and uh, yeah, keep your eyes open. There's there's quite a lot. Uh, uh, you know, uh, revenue cloud is actually going to be taken to the next level uh, using using subscription management. So that's uh, that's coming up soon. Um, cool. Uh, moving on, um, you know, I just want to talk about uh, you know the high level data model, and uh, um, you know, I I, I said I, I I mentioned about unified you know uh, one data model. So that's what I'm going to be talking about right now. Um, so uh, what you see here is the uh, is a unified one data model. So at the end of the day, we're talking about passing very clean data all the way from operations and uh, to your finance system. So uh, Salesforce EPG billing actually unifies the revenue lifecycle on the platform, right? So uh, you you leverage Salesforce EPG to manage all your complex quoting, your uh, quotation generation, uh, you know, and then you then you actually generate your contracts. You have your uh, legal team actually coming in and doing your redlining and et cetera, uh, you know, approvals, uh, all of that, uh, and, and, and generating your orders, you know, directly from the code. So, uh, uh, let's, let's take an example, right? Let's take an example of, uh, uh, you know, of a telecommunication company. So, uh, usually their contracts would be pretty big, you know, they would have a service contract, they would have a, uh, uh, you know, um, um, you know, a de very detailed kind of a service contract, which would actually need, uh, approvals from the legal team. Um, and the sales reps have very limited, uh, you know, capability in terms of um, changing any of the terms and conditions, you know, because because those terms and conditions are uh, usually set for about thirty odd years, because that's how that's how big the deal the 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 term of a telecom contract would be. So you would need the legal team coming in at the right time, ensuring that the court is locked from the sales uh, uh, sales team to make sure that they don't make any changes. The legal team would come in. They would make, you know, they would do any redlining, etc. And and you know, all, all of this, we can actually get it done using Salesforce CPQ. But it is also possible by connecting, uh, you know, contract management tools like Conga, DocuSign, etc., which can handle this, you know, pretty easily. So you have your contract lifecycle management tools, which can connect to uh, Salesforce CPQ, um, and and help in help in doing some of these contract, uh, you know, redlining, etc. And once once the legal team has approved it. You're talking about uh, generating your contracts and orders uh, directly from the court. So this whole process of uh, you know happens very very easily, and from there onwards, we are talking about Salesforce billing. So uh, in this particular diagram that that I have over here, um, I've actually got um, you know the uh, the light blue ones are the standard objects. So opportunity account etc. is a standard object. Um, CPQ objects are the darker blue ones. So you got court. Uh, you know, product price is also uh, a standard object. Product then price book is a standard object itself. Order is also a standard object. But what I'm trying to highlight here is these are the main objects which are a part of your CPQ package. So quote uh, object that we have is a custom object for uh, uh, for Salesforce CPQ. We already we also have the standard quote object from Salesforce, but that's not being utilized by the package. So we use a custom object called uh, uh, quote 
you usually have your sbqq double underscore which identifies that you know particular object is a part of the managed package um you have contract which is a standard object under contract you also have subscription i haven't called that out i haven't gone to that level of detail here uh subscriptions you can imagine subscription as a line item of contract um quote would actually have again line items called quote line items it's a custom object um and uh, associated with that are the orders and uh, and assets orders also will have line items called order line items um and any one time product would actually be created as an asset any recurring products would be created as subscriptions against the contract so um so that's the reason why you know salesforce epq can actually handle one time sales and recurring sales pretty pretty effectively and uh, once that's done we move into the billing side of things that's where you actually have your usage invoice obviously there are a lot of other uh you know objects also like payments invoice line items etc i haven't gone to that level of detail but uh, at a very high level uh and 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 if you're also doing revenue recognition you have your revenue schedule towards the end um you also see a lot of orange colored ones there uh that's that's because of the fact that you know you we are i've actually assumed that um all these all these systems uh i mean all these uh, functionalities around invoicing around accounting is actually resting in an erp system so i've assumed that you know mulesoft is the uh, uh is the esb as is a middleware and we are actually connecting uh you know um, a particular um uh, you know i mean the salesforce epq and billing objects to uh, to a, to whatever erp it can be um you know it can be sap it can be uh, net suite is whatever it doesn't matter um you know but whatever is the erp we are actually connecting to that so these functionalities around order fulfillment let's say invoice presentation uh, credit note generation etc can be handled in erp but at the same time i'll be talking about it in some time uh, we can handle quite a lot of this within the salesforce billing package also um the important thing over here is you know salesforce epq and billing is an adaptable solution right so you don't there's you're not you're not being constrained by the fact that you know oh you know because uh, you know these these capabilities are there as a part of the package we have to use that there's nothing of that sort depending on the use case so for a manufacturing uh, company you would probably rely on the erp quite a lot to take care of the accounting needs but if you're talking about a subscription based i mean if, if it's a company that's selling licenses uh then you kind of rely on salesforce epq quite a lot um, i mean the revenue cloud package quite a lot if you're talking about telecom you might you know have a 50 50 kind of a thing so there's quite a lot that we can leverage from the package rest of it because it's an oss and bss system you know we kind of rely on the uh on 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 those particular systems quite a lot so uh it's 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 very adaptable and uh, you can actually configure it to meet uh, you know your customers needs um and uh, in in one of the in the upcoming slides i'll actually talk about you know some of those very common uh, implementation patterns uh, that we have actually seen uh, you know with customers and uh, what is the most common pattern or something that i'll explain to you in 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 the upcoming slides um moving to the next one uh, it's the uh, uh, pricing and discounts uh, data model uh, obviously uh, the the uh, the image is very you know it's it's not it's not very clear uh and and i've actually included a um, you know the link uh, to this particular data it's a huge data model uh you know there's quite a lot i've only taken few sections from here so i've taken the pricing and discounts here i've taken the product and i've also taken the quote template and i think these are pretty pretty relevant from uh you know your cpq certification standpoint and probably from a cta perspective also what i've heard um from uh, from yogi and some of the others is uh, i think from a cta uh, standpoint i think it's salesforce cpq uh, which is uh, in scope uh, salesforce billing i don't think it's really in scope so uh, this data model will actually be uh, quite helpful so um the link is there uh, you can go to that and you can actually uh, you know see the full picture but uh, essentially what we're talking about here the light colored ones price book entry and price book like i said earlier is uh i i a standard object is a part of your sales cloud package um everything else which is kind of colored in a different color they are all a part of the uh, managed package so you have in this particular case i'm talking exclusively about price uh, pricing and discount so you have your price rule you have your price condition uh you have your price action against it and from a pricing standpoint you actually have your price dimension block price cost etc uh apart from all this there is also a summary variable which is linked to your you know your price condition your error condition when you talk about product rule and when we talk about code templates you actually have your uh, uh, you know your your uh, template code condition also which you know all of that is linked to your summary variable so that's that's kind of outside of all this um and uh, there is also a small description that i've actually given about uh, you know what are the different product fields 
which will be used, which is specific to pricing. I have also given, uh, you know, there's also an indication there about pricing waterfalls. So you start with your list price, then you actually apply your system discounts and it becomes your regular price. Then you apply your additional discounts and uh, it becomes your customer price. Then you apply any partner discounts, if applicable, it becomes your uh, partner price. And then you have your distributed discounts over there and then you actually get your net price. So that's your pricing waterfall, a very important uh, concept, both from a Salesforce CPQ certification standpoint, and I'm pretty sure from a, from a CTA standpoint also. Um, and then there are uh, there's also a, a small description around uh, price dimensions, especially around multidimensional coating, uh, a very important concept where you actually have the capability of pricing for uh, a multi-year deal. So you can split your deal into, into multiple years. Uh, so MDQ is a, is a very, uh, very interesting uh, concept, got its own set of limitations also, but uh, very, very important uh, concept at the same time. And uh, um, there's also the last one there around uh, contracted pricing, which uh, I'll, I'll just speak about uh, in, you know, at a very high level. So contracted pricing is where uh, you actually have the capability of giving, setting up you know, a specific price uh, it might be a discounted price. So it's called negotiated price. So you say you have, uh, you know, uh, a license might call, probably cost $100, but, you know, you negotiated a price with your customer for about $80. So you can actually set a start date and end date and, uh, you know, define that in your contracted price against the account. Um, so that's contracted price. So all of that is, uh, you know, is a, is, is, is a part of your uh, pricing data model. Um, <clears throat> moving to the next one is the product specific one. Very similar there, you know, you actually have your product rule against the product rule, you have your error condition and your product action. Uh, error condition, like I said, is linked to your summary variable, just like your uh, price condition. And from a product uh, configuration standpoint, uh, under the product, you have your feature, you have your option, uh, you have your configuration attribute, um, you know, and then you can actually define some configuration rules for your, uh, for your product and uh, there can be an option constraint. So these things, you know, we, we talk about bundles quite a lot. Any, any CPQ we speak about, we speak about bundles, right? So uh, uh, your features, your product option, all of that actually helps in constructing your bundle. So let's say you act, you know, I'll take a real estate, uh, you know, as an example, right? So, um, you know, out here in Australia, you actually sell uh, houses as a package. So you have a house and you have your kitchen, you have your bedrooms, you have your, uh, you know, uh, all, all your other rooms are there, you you can actually consider a house as a bundle. You can play around with your uh, your configurations quite a lot. And depending... Uh, uh, and um, it'd, be, it'd be good be good if you can go and mute. I don't care if you go and mute. Thanks, thanks, Arun. Um, so yeah, so um, when we when we speak about a bundle, let's. I, I was speaking about the house bundle. So depending on you know what products, what what attributes you want to add, your price will change, and the uh, the price of that house will change. So um, so you can imagine that your uh, uh, a feature would probably be your uh, your bedrooms, your uh, your kitchen, uh, your living room. And as we go below, your product options can be, um, you know, within the kitchen, you can actually have your, uh, your gas stove, um, you know, uh, a, um, a storeroom, et cetera. Those can, those can actually be product options. And configuration attributes can be, you know, how you actually want to change some of these options. Like, for example, if I take the gas stove, do you want like a, a four burner one or a six burner one? Those can be your configuration attributes. So depending on what you select, the price will change. So that's how you build your bundle. Um, and, and this is all related to your... Uh, standard uh, Salesforce object product. So you actually have all these as child objects against uh, the product. And uh, selection of these can be based on, uh, uh, you know, you can actually have a product rule, uh, which will help in, uh, you know, ensuring that we build rules to, we spoke about quote accuracy earlier. So product rules will ensure that our quoting is, uh, is accurate and the products that you select has got the right uh, you know, right configuration. So if you select one product, you will not be able to select the other one. Or if you select one, you can automatically add the other one. So things of that sort uh, can be easily done using a product rule. Um, the next one I want to talk about is the code template data model. Again, not getting into the details of it. You know, you you actually have that uh, that in there. And uh, within the code template, you actually have your term condition, again, linked to your summary variable. So uh, uh, summary variable, uh, you know, because I, I did speak about summary variable quite a lot, I'll, I'll talk about what summary variable is. So summary variable will actually help in, you know, you can imagine it is a roll-up summary field, 
um you know but just that you are using uh salesforce cpq to do a roll up so you can build your own logic uh using uh, using using summary variables and that logic can actually drive some of the conditions to 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 select the right product or ensure that the right price is put in or in this case the right code condition is is plugged in so um uh, so that's what the term condition is that's also linked to your summary variable and the rest of the objects over here is related to your code template now just speaking about code template again from a best practice standpoint um depending on the use case that you have if it's a very simple kind of a template then probably uh, the salesforce cpq uh, code template works quite a lot um but if you're looking at very dynamic and uh, um you know something which is a little more scalable you have a lot of uh, uh, code document generation uh, tools docusign conga they all have uh, excellent connection uh, you know inbuilt connection with uh, uh with with salesforce cpq works really really well and uh, depending on the salesforce cpq package uh you know license that you uh that you offer you even get uh conga uh, a stripped down version of conga composer along with the license so you can even leverage that um so um i'll probably keep that for another one because that's uh me and mira have spoken quite a lot about it um we can we can talk about it in detail in probably another session but i'll i'll keep that for another time um the next thing i want to talk about are some of the implementation approaches uh this is a very important thing when you talk this is probably not very important from a uh, from a certification standpoint or anything of that sort but then you know from a core implementation perspective from a consulting standpoint this is extremely extremely important and an area that i'm i'm you know really passionate about right um and uh, this is this is probably an area where you know if we get this right i think any revenue cloud implementation will actually become really successful usually partners would you know not get this part right and that's where you know your implementation goes for a toss so uh, it's about you know we we speak about mvp quite a lot uh, most uh, viable product a valuable product a viable product so um, what is mvp from a revenue cloud standpoint so there are usually at a very high level we can talk about four different approaches so one is where you actually have your order to billing and we are relying completely on uh you know your accounting system or your erp to take care of all your accounting needs so that's the first one that we have so it's a salesforce billing data is sent to the erp for invoicing so um you know let's say a manufacturing industry use case like i said you know it's better to rely on that particular system for accounting because it's got its own ways of dealing with things um the next one which is probably the most important one and ideal for an mvp is the order to invoice uh, uh, approach where you actually have salesforce managing uh, your invoice delivery um you know everything until invoice uh, generation including the invoice document generation can be done using salesforce billing and everything from there you know including your payments your collections uh, your revenue recognition all of that can be done uh, you know in an erp so that's that's the, the and and once we take that kind of an approach uh, the advantage of doing that is once we once we implement let's say we go we are live with mvp1 and mvp2 we can think about slowly migrating some of those capabilities into salesforce billing let's say migrating payments into billing then probably thinking about moving collections everything until your general ledger can be done in salesforce billing general ledger uh and uh you know uh has to be done in the uh in the uh, in the accounting system that's not something that can be done within uh the salesforce billing uh package so general ledger is always outside of uh, uh the revenue cloud package the next thing like i said you know you have order to payment so that can be a good mvp2 uh method and order to revenue recognition uh you know considering the fact that revenue recognition uh can be done using salesforce billing you actually have the capability to generate revenue schedules and transactions you can use salesforce um, billing and salesforce billing works really really well for revenue recognitions but then um if we take the telecom uh use case as an example uh revenue recognition for a telecom industry is extremely complicated you know and cfos would actually have their own ways of uh recognizing revenue because the deals are pretty big and there's a lot of factors which actually depend you know influence uh you know recognizing revenue and ensuring that is actually so or revenue recognition has to be uh you know aligned to something called ac 606 uh, uh principles of accounting so to make sure that all of that is aligned sometimes cfos would actually think about you know relying on an erp but at the same time when we talk about a simple uh, subscription based industry of selling licenses revenue recognition can be done very easily uh, you know within salesforce uh, the billing itself so uh, the capability is there it completely depends on uh, on the use case 
uh, I've actually included a few, uh, um, you know, uh, names of some of the most prominent, uh, uh, you know, accounting systems. There. NetSuite is a very, very uh, common system that we integrate integrate to. SAP is there. Uh, Great Plains, the micro dynamics Green Plates, the uh, Intact, Workday, you know, depending on whatever. And it can, it can even be like, for example, the um, the last project that I I, I did before joining Simplis, uh, sorry, before uh, joining Salesforce at Simplis was, um, you know, uh, integration to a system called Technology One. You know, um, uh, you know, it's it's a uh, it's 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 an on-premise uh, uh, accounting system, um, and uh, you know that that particular integration actually demanded uh, we we did that using Dell Boomi. So uh, using something like Dell Boomi or or uh, you know MuleSoft is is really important. You know, when you think about that level of integration, because there's a lot of transformation that's required so it can be it can be any ERP or accounting system for that matter um, next one I want to talk about are some of the unique use cases now, I'm not going to spend too much of time because I know that you know it's, it's already about uh, about 40 odd minutes um, so um, we uh, some of the uh, I'm 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 Instead of getting into, I will I will speak about some unique use cases, etc. But uh, when we speak of the product to order uh, scenario, the cash scenario is coming after this. But we speak about product to order. Some of the common challenges that we it's it's mainly from a sales rep standpoint, right? So um, you know we will have issues where you know we 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 are actually uh, taking a long time to create a code. That actually is probably the most uh, you know common issue because uh, pricing is extremely complicated. Uh, you know the prices are you know in in probably ten different tables. You don't have it in a single place. You know that's a, that's a very unique uh, that's a very very common use case uh, to go for something like you know a code to cash system. Um, then you the, I I think I spoke about this earlier, you know, where you actually have your quotes and contracts going out with wrong products and wrong pricing. Finance team would be knocking on your door and asking, you know, uh, why have you actually got your pricing wrong? You know, that's actually going to impact your margin. So, um, you know, we, we, are, we are actually wasting our, uh, you know, the sales tips are actually wasting their selling time because that would mean that you need to go back to the customer uh, or, or, you know, you would have probably already sold to the customer. The customer is actually going to demand the same kind of discounts, you know, going forward also, which becomes a problem, right? So, um, you know, it, 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 uh, it it uh, really wastes uh, you know the selling time and you know the margins and the commissions that the sales reps are actually going to get and and even you know the problem is that uh, at the end of the day when you don't have you know uh, when you don't have things on a, on on you know something like a Salesforce CPQ um, you actually have limited insight into into what kind of uh, you know deals are going out and you know how your pricing etc is done. Um, Obviously, as a result of that, you know, you actually have your uh, your growth targets are missed, and uh, you know, sales cycle will become an issue. And and at the end of the day, your customers' lifetime value actually you know decreases. So um, these are these are common challenges which will force any uh, you know any 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 company you know be it a subscription based company or a manufacturing company to move to something like a cold to cash uh, system. Uh, the next one I actually want to call out is the the next part of it. You know, the order to cash process. Again, uh, this is an area where the finance team, you know, uh, starts scrubbing, right? They they actually have a lot of billing inefficiencies, um, and and there are a lot of key metrics. You know, you we we speak about uh, ARR, annual recurring revenue, monthly recurring revenue, the total contract value. So there's quite a lot of metrics uh, related to subscription-based billing, but even the manufacturing one-time sale also. You know, there's a lot of metrics which the finance team will be, uh, you know, will be tracking. So if you uh, let's say uh, I spoke about the scenario earlier, you know, you actually have uh, a sales rep. If you don't have this level of, you know insight into what the customer has a customer already paid their previous bills etc you know you you will you will you will you will actually be selling to a customer who's already got a lot of debt uh, so um, you know that's 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 not something that the finance team uh, will be very happy with so your your debt actually increases and uh, you know you also want to ensure that your cash flow is there how do you track your cash flow so uh, uh, you know we we have to make sure that our uh, there's something called dso decreased uh, sorry day sales out uh, uh, sales outstanding, so that should that should actually be going down to ensure that you know there's enough cash flow and uh, the, the the company can actually make progress. I mean, uh, profit, um, and uh, we also need to make sure that you know human errors are reduced as much as possible. This becomes extremely important uh, when you're talking about contract amendments. So um, you know, let's say you have a scenario where you're doing an amendment, 
and uh, you know there is an issue with proration um, you know so so six months down the line in a you know under a contract is getting amended and uh, instead of if a system does not have the capability to actually calculate the right prorated amount you're losing a lot of money or you're actually charging the customer wrongly so this can you know this is related to human errors so something like salesforce cpq handles proration very very effectively you can actually have a proration set at a cpq level you can have a proration set at a at a billing level also and there is quite a lot of methods of proration that you can do which i'll probably talk about you know sometime else but you know um, there's quite a lot that we can do so uh, that level of intricacy i still remember uh, um, when 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 I, when I actually showed proration to one of the customers in the past, they 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 were shocked that you know this kind of a capability actually exists because they used to manually divide you know the amount by the number of days remaining in the year and uh, you know they would actually put a divisor uh, there is a multiplication value or something that's what they do so when they saw this happening they were you know there's quite a lot of time that they were saving so which will mean that the finance team can actually focus on things which are more important um and uh, i also spoke about you know how revenue recognition uh, has to comply with asc 606 principles etc so all of that uh, you know um, salesforce billing actually handles all of that very effectively uh, next thing I want to talk about is, you know, how uh, there, there is something called an external configurator. So uh, you can connect Salesforce CPQ uh, to, you know, to, to, to external configurators. This is um, particularly relevant, uh, you know, let's say in a manufacturing space or you're uh, in, in, the, in the automotive space. So you want to configure a car, uh, you know, in this particular case, you can actually see, uh, uh, you know, a forklift over there um, and this capability... <coughs> is done using something called KV Max. So KV Max is an external package. You can actually connect KV Max. You can do 3D modeling. Um, so essentially, that particular forklift that you see there is a bundle, and it's got a different, different, you know, different components in there. Each component can actually be your options, depending on what you actually add. And you actually see this, you know, happening right in front of your eyes. So, um, you know, KV Max is a very common uh, external configurator that you can connect very seamlessly uh, to to Salesforce CPQ. They're all packages available uh, on the App Exchange. So, um, and and there's some configuration to be done, some level of customization also, uh, but they talk to each other very well. Um, I've also given an example of NOC. NO6 NO6 is, uh, um, is 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 pretty prominent again available on the app exchange uh, so let's say so this was a project that i was actually a part of previously um, where you actually have sap variant configurator and uh, you know if you have if you're using sap variant configurator it's very difficult to actually integrate that to uh, to salesforce cpq um, you know using uh, traditional integration methods but no6 actually helps in connecting that very easily and uh, last but not the least, you got Propel there. Uh, so product lifecycle management is not usually something that's done as a part of any CPQ package, but Propel actually helps in, uh, you know, incubating uh, products and sunsetting products, et cetera. So um, it also helps in, you know, in coming up with customized products. So if there is an engineer to order kind of a scenario, Propel actually helps in that. So these are all packages which can connect very seamlessly to, uh, to Salesforce CPQ. So these are some of those unique use cases that I was referring to, but uh, even though unique, it is, quite common. Uh, the next thing I just want to kind of touch base on a very high level is, uh, you know, what are, uh, so so a new new package, which is actually there, uh, which connects Salesforce field service to uh, to billing. Uh, so this is also available on the on the App Exchange. So if you want to generate invoices from your work orders, et cetera, um, this was something which is unthinkable earlier, but, uh, you know, we actually have this capability also. So if any of you have a scenario where you have, you're implementing field service and uh, your customers are actually asking for uh, CPQ and billing, you know, you, you actually have have that uh, capability also. Um, next thing I want to kind of touch base on is uh, CPQ for partner communities. Pretty sure a lot of you would have probably uh, seen this. I have seen this many, many times. Um, you know, so so there are there are separate licenses actually available CPQ for uh, communities. So um, you can you can um, you know you can expose uh, CPQ. You can expose your code object. You can do a quick code creation, etc. And and any key data that the customer actually wants to see. It's like for example, if the or customer wants to track you know the status of the order, all of that can be exposed on communities and obviously experience cloud you know you can customize it you know whatever way you want to depending on how uh, bespoke and how beautiful the customer actually wants it to be but at the end of the day what's running behind is uh, salesforce cpq and uh, 
the next thing i want to touch base on at a very high level i'm not going to get into the details of it uh, so these are these are different you know different functionalities you know you have your uh, uh, usage mediation you have your invoice rating usage rating taxation uh, invoice document generation uh, you have your payments and then you have your revenue recognition so um, uh, a lot of it can be you know like for example invoice document generation can be done uh, using salesforce billing but then you know you actually need to rely on something like conga taxation especially when you're dealing with taxation in in the states in the united states uh, you know you have to rely on an external taxation engine like avalara or vertex uh, revenue recognition like i said earlier you know there are uh, you know uh, partners like right for etc you know they can they, they 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 can handle revenue recognition very very seamlessly so uh, depending on the scenario you might have to connect to uh, to an external system some of these packages are actually available or uh, you know on the app exchange some of them you know you might need to uh, uh, have an integration place but you know most of them are on the cloud and you know apis are available to uh, to to consume very easily <clears throat> um the next thing the last thing that i want to touch base on is the enablement uh, pathway that we have um you know um um I'm, i'm sure all of you recognize a person uh, in the middle you know that's that's a very own uh, god of there and uh, um what what they say is by 2026 uh you know we uh, salesforce is set to create about 9.3 million uh new jobs and uh you know there'll be 1.6 trillion dollars of new business by 2026 so um and all of this is actually going to be possible using our trailblazer uh you know community uh you know it's 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 already about 15 million people and it's it's only growing um so this is the enablement path that you have uh you can actually start off with your cpq certification and uh, if you're really interested in billing you get into your billing specialist and your advanced billing uh, specialist super badges uh, which is called the billing super set and uh, these two things are uh, you know um, a necessity if you want to get your revenue cloud accredited professional consultant which is on the partner learning camp a very very important uh, certification uh, accreditation rather and uh, it will be used to judge uh you know partners going forward uh because uh if you are an accredited professional it is a true indication that you're really really passionate about salesforce cpq and billing and uh you know becomes a very easy option for uh you know salesforce to actually go for that particular partner uh so so that's uh, that's already there uh you know you you can you can you can definitely give it a shot and as you uh if you want to really go into the advanced uh, cpq and billing topics you know you have your multi currency uh, uh you know you have your data migration which is an extremely i'll probably talk about that in in another uh, section uh, i mean in another session uh, and from a billing standpoint you're talking about multi cloud billing finance logging and things like that so you know a lot of advanced uh, topics also so i've actually given links to uh, the trailblazer community for cpq and billing i've also given a couple of other links around uh, if you want to start you know get started with salesforce billing what are some of the best practices Uh, I've actually given a link to that, and you know, a link to uh, some of the uh, you know tips and tricks for uh, CPQ. Um, great, I think uh, that was the last one, and I know that you know it's it's been it's been a long one. It's about fifty minutes. Um, I will end my session there. Uh, Mira, do you want to take the questions yeah. now or or? Uh, yeah thank you so much suraj so that was really helpful at least i was able to understand some of the features that i was not aware about like some sure. of the features additional features of cpq uh, maybe yeah. we can take two three questions before moving to the next session okay. that is okay absolutely 100% okay. yes so yeah. Yeah. there is a question from nansa pratap actually what are the best and recommended methods to deploy cpq and building configurations to higher environment okay okay um so so you can um uh, you know you can you can use um, uh, something called prodly um uh, you know prodly mover is uh, uh, so cpq is all about reference data right so um so prodly mover is is one of the most prominent uh, tools out there which has actually got templates uh, you know which will allow you to migrate reference data from one org to the other i mean to from one environment to the other um, otherwise you're talking about doing a lot of vlook curves and what not and you know moving it but prodly mover helps you to move data very easily and uh, if you want to move your uh, metadata you can 
obviously rely on change it if you want to but if you have you know uh, um, you know uh, you know a pipeline or you know if you have uh, github or whatever you know uh, in place you know you can use that uh, jenkins you know it doesn't matter but uh, unfortunately none of the uh, uh, you know ci cd systems actually support movement of reference data out of the box you need kind of, i think you need to customize it quite a lot but uh, prodly mover is uh, is what uh we actually recommend every customer to get so that you know reference data can be migrated very easily yeah uh thank you suraj i guess that answered uh, that question and sure. i have got another question suraj so yeah. you mentioned mm -hmm. yeah you mentioned about uh, this product recommendation which is basically an ai feature yeah. right so is that yes. available as part of the standard cpq package itself or that is an additional license that we need to get no it is not uh, it is not an additional license but there is a small uh, so so i'll again this is something that we can keep to another one uh, there is a, something called code calculator plugin or product search plugin you know it is a javascript code so uh, you can actually have to write a small code snippet i think the uh, product recommendation snippet is probably available on help itself salesforce help itself you can actually use that and uh, you know add it into your uh, into your uh, uh, you know into your script and uh, you know just call that uh, plugin uh, from your uh, you know from your managed package settings so in that way next the next time you actually open up code line editor you would actually get a list so you can click on a button rather it's a custom action you click on that button and the user will actually get a list based on the conditions that you have defined in your code so that's your so that's available out of the box uh, you know you just need to write a small code for that Oh, okay. So it is through QCP plugin. Yes, yes. yes. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Got yeah. it. And there's one more question uh, from sure. Chitra. How does uh -huh. discounts or sync to billing and does it support stackable discounts? Yeah. So uh, uh, discounts, uh, you know, is something that is applied at the uh, at the coating level uh, or the C on the CPQ level. So any discounts that you apply there. uh you know if it if there is an approval process well and good you know it's approved and once it's been applied then it's set in stone right so we are not going to be changing uh any pricing at the billing level um so discounts obviously you know whatever discount it can be discount schedule it can be volume discounts you know your uh, term discounts whatever it is you know it doesn't matter uh but anything that you apply there and uh, once the order has been generated it's set in stone and then the discount would actually be so whether you want to expose a discount on your invoice or do you want to send that discount uh, itself uh, you know to your billing system etc you know there's quite a lot that we can do it depends on the use case but uh, once it's done in cpq then we're not going to be changing any discounts on billing is that the question or i hope and so sta sta stackable discounts i i i i don't know what Uh, uh you were referring to um maybe you can clarify and i can or or we can we can have a separate chat on that yeah sure sure suresh uh okay. probably we'll take one last question it's from arthur sure. will have to make bill versus buy decision for cpq uh bill versus uh buy decision as in from from buying the cpq package or 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 you know from a uh uh from a deal standpoint i'm 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 not uh, sure when you yeah um understand you know like uh, uh when would you go for um buying a cpq product you know like i can so if there okay. is a requirement um then yeah 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 uh, would i decide you know like do i need a cpq package or should i write a custom code for it okay great great question so i think uh, some of those use cases that i actually explained earlier those challenges right um you know beat the uh, cpq side challenges or the uh, billing side challenges if um if if it's if it's those very basic kind of a challenge where um it it completely depends on the use case also so let's say you have a uh, you you're talking about utilities industry you know you're talking about um you know there's a lot of different plans etc where uh, you know there are like 10 different tables and you know there's a lot of complex pricing etc then definitely you need a cpq you cannot do that using a you know a custom thing 
<laughs> but then if you're talking about something very as simple as you know uh, the the company has only got about four or five licenses and you know they're saying oh we need a cpq you don't really need that you know you can you can actually write a very simple like for example there was a uh, insurance use case if i'm right about this about four or five years back where um, you know there was a lot of discussion whether we want to go for cpq or not but uh, at the end of the day we didn't go for cpq uh, the the customer was actually very happy with the customization that we had done so there was a few uh, lightning web components and uh, some other logic that we had done uh, written and uh, you know we actually achieved the whole thing they're still using it without cpq so it, it depends on the use case yeah Okay, makes sense. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you, Atul, and thanks, Suresh. So sure. I guess okay. we will have more questions, but considering the time, probably we can move <laughs> to the next session. Let's 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 do that. Yeah. I, again, that is also going to take some time, but uh, you know, I think it should be should be pretty interesting. So I'll I'll switch to switch to that now. Sure. Uh, Just give me one second, uh, Mira. I will probably stop sharing first. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us today. And sorry, I wasn't able to join in person. I had to pre-record this due to a conflict, but anyway. Mira, are you able to see the recording now? Yes, I'm able to oh. hear it also. Okay, great. Okay, let's go through Salesforce Industry CPQ. Uh, my name is Georgi and I will be talking to you about Salesforce CPQ today. So let me share my screen here. All right, let's get started. Um, so I think you've all seen this before, forward-looking statements, you know, make your purchasing decisions on what's based in the, uh, what's in the product today, not on what's on the roadmap. I don't think I'll really be talking about anything that's not GA, but uh, you know the drill. All right, so um, for the agenda today, I'll give a quick introduction of myself, um, and then I'll do an introduction of what was formerly known as Velocity and Velocity CPQ and what is now Industry Cloud and Industry CPQ to give you some context of you know, what, what is the greater application that contains Industry CPQ. We'll talk about the data model a bit, the transactional data model um, related to customers and the flow of the sales related objects. We'll go through the key features. I won't go into all of the CPQ features in depth just due to time. Um, there's another uh, recording in the um, enablement resources that will go into a deeper dive on all the features if you want to take a look at that. Um, and finally, we'll do a bit of a, a comparison between industry cloud and revenue cloud, um, where they're similar, where they're different. And finally, uh, enablement resources, so links to learn more. And unfortunately, I won't be, um, I'm not live to do a Q&A, but uh, for questions, hopefully, Suraj will be able to answer a few and any others, you can reach out to me. <clears throat> okay, so to introduce myself, uh, my name is Georgi Sevelyev. I'm a senior program architect, uh, specifically for communications cloud at Salesforce. Um, I'm based in Singapore. Uh, my name is pronounced Georgi with a soft G, not Georgie. Uh, it's a tough one. Um, I'm a certified technical architect. So here in this picture, um, I passed my CTA back in December and I decided to, to celebrate to print out like a huge, you know, one meter poster of it and took a picture, uh, posted on LinkedIn. It was very popular, I think, probably due to the flip flops here. Um, so I have seven years plus of Salesforce experience. I started at a customer, went to an SI, then joined an ISV, specifically Velocity, and now I'm at Salesforce. I've, uh, I'm working on communications cloud uh, for quite a while. I've done eight implementation or been involved in eight implementations. Um, I'm a certification junkie. I have 35 uh, Salesforce certs. And then in terms of community groups uh, over here, we have the Ben Lux CTA study group. I co-founded this with Kate and Sergey a couple of years back. Here is our a meeting like two, three years ago where we had Carl Brundage joining us virtually to share some great insights. Um, and also the Moscow developer user group. This was our, our first meeting like two years ago. Um, all right, so let's, uh, that's a bit about me. Let's talk about uh, industry cloud and industry CPQ. 
Um, so before I can talk about industry CPQ, I need to tell you what, what exactly is industry cloud, where does industry CPQ, like which clouds does it fit into? So let's talk about that. Um, <clears throat> if you're familiar with uh, sales cloud or service cloud or just the general Salesforce platform, you'll be aware that these solve general sales and service use cases, but each industry has its own unique you know, things to it. Like if we're talking about financial services, you care about what kind of financial accounts the customer has, and you know, there's no out of box financial account object or something to represent that um, with just base sales and service cloud. And then uh, also a lot of these industries have their own unique flavors to them where you know, as part of the sales process, usually the quotes are complex and then you bring in CPQ or some other modules like that. So that <clears throat> idea behind these industry clouds is that um, it builds on top of what's there in Salesforce, adds something to the data model, typically has some other modules involved and that gives you your industry cloud. So as of today, there are 12 um, industries that are available in terms of um, what was formerly known as Velocity that got acquired by Salesforce about two years back. Um, we have the following six clouds. So there's public sector, energy and utilities, media, communications, aka telco, health and financial services cloud. And today the focus will be on industry CPQ, which covers these three clouds here, communications, media, and energy. Uh, you may be wondering, you know, why, why specifically these three? Uh, the reason for that is I think historical due to other platforms that would group these three together. And really the reason for that is because all three of these in, um, industries uh, sell similar kinds of products that are related to services. So in telco, you're talking about the, um, you know, mobile phone service that you have, internet service, TV service. In media, we could be talking about, you know, some kind of streaming service, a gaming service, uh, things like that, advertisement services. And then in energy and utilities, you're talking about, you know, your heating and electricity services. You'll notice the keyword services there many times. The fact that all of these are revolved around services, we care about the life cycle of that service. Uh, because the products that all three of these industries sell are similar in that regard, uh, the business processes end up being similar, the needs in terms of data models and different modules end up being similar, and you know, that's kind of why they're grouped together. Um, and just a, an aside, in uh, Velocity, formerly Velocity Insurance, which is now part of um, Financial Services Cloud, there is kind of a mini CPQ-like uh, functionality for quoting, but it's a different you know, product, different functionalities than what we're talking about here. So really, industry CPQ applies for these three verticals. All right, so uh, let's talk about the um, solution map and industry cloud in a bit more detail. So um, like I mentioned, industry cloud, but uh, consists of a lot more than just industry CPQ. So let me give a bit more flavor on that. So this diagram is showing um, with uh, industry cloud, Salesforce and the various Salesforce related products, uh, what your architecture could look like. Um, so maybe let's start at the very bottom. Um, MuleSoft can act as the integration layer. You'll definitely have some integrations and MuleSoft can do um, all of those great things to you know, simplify those integrations and uh, handle the orchestration, authentication, all of that sort of thing. Then uh, uh, industry, so when I say the word industry cloud, by the way, I mean uh, the uh, communications, media, and energy clouds uh, throughout this presentation, um, just in terms of you know simplification for talking, I'll say uh, industry cloud instead of those three industries. So uh, industry cloud is built natively on Salesforce, it's a managed package under the hood. Um, and then, you know, it, it works well with sales and service cloud. We'll see in the data model that it leverages the uh, standard objects that are part of sales and service cloud. So I think all of you guys are familiar with that. And then this orange piece is really where we get into the industry cloud specific. So let me start from down here. So the data model, um, like I mentioned, you know, each of these industries have their own unique data model needs. We'll talk about that a bit more in the following slides. Then we have what is called um, Omni Studio. Omni Studio consists of these things here. So Omni scripts and flex cards, these are for the front end. And then data raptors and integration procedures, these are for the back end. And then industry DX, this is for deploying your uh, industry cloud um, data between orgs. So just to give a little bit more flavor, 
Uh, OmniScripts, you can think of them as the analog to a Salesforce screen flow. Uh, you can define you know, a guided process that walks the user through a series of steps, have business logic in there. And then uh, those OmniScripts can be uh, exposed uh, in the Lightning platform, in Experience Cloud, or even off-platform via something called OmniOut. Um, then we have flex cards. Flex cards, you can think of them as a uh, kind of declarative alternative to custom LWC. So you can define um, the format of how you want to display data, some business logic behind it, conditions, actions that you can launch from the flex card. Uh, and then the, the data source of the flex card could be data that's coming from Salesforce or from other systems or both. And then your flex cards can be put on the uh, Salesforce page layouts, uh, can be embedded in OmniScripts and all of that good stuff. So basically both of these are, are front end. Um, data Raptors, you can think of them as an analog to a declarative analog for uh, DML and SQL. So this allows you to pull data from Salesforce, write data into Salesforce with no code. And then we have integration procedures. Um, these integration procedures uh, can have data raptors inside of them. They can do calculations and business logic. You can think of them as a configurable analog to either Apex code or uh, like a record triggered flow where you can define you know, the series of steps that the integration procedure is doing. And then that integration procedure can be the data source for you know, an Omni script or a flex card, or it can be invoked by Apex, REST API, et cetera. So uh, all of these things allow you to you know, implement more declaratively uh, with less code. Industry DX, this is for deploying data uh, between orgs. So um, all of these things, OmniScripts, flex cards, data raptors, integration procedures, these are actually um, you know, managed objects that are part of the package. And the, the data that defines a data raptor is actual records. You need to deploy those records between environments maintain the fact that you know this data raptor is referenced by this integration procedure so maintain the relationships um, industry dx will allow you to extract uh, the the you know data behind these and then deploy it in different works as well as the um, enterprise product catalog and then speaking of which enterprise product catalog you know in cpq basically we're selling products enterprise product catalog is where you define the products the pricing the rules etc we won't deep dive into that here, but you can think of this as you know, the design time equivalent for CPQ. Then we have CPQ and digital commerce. We'll talk about these in more detail as we go on. Uh, we have contract lifecycle management. So this is the ability to generate a contract, um, generate a document related to that contract that pulls in the customer information, what they've purchased, et cetera, send it to the customer for their e-signature via an integration with DocuSign. Um, all of that good stuff. Then order management. So once we have an order created from CPQ, we submit it to um, order management or OM for short. And then OM will handle the orchestration um, to other systems. So we can say that you know we need uh, the billing system to start billing the customer. We need the shipping system to ship out the goods. We need the provisioning system to uh, provision those goods and activate them and so on. You know, it needs to happen in this sequence. These actions need to happen before those actions. All of that is uh, configurable within OM. Then billing inquiry management, uh, different than what we saw in Revenue Cloud, there is no um, industry's billing application as part of industry cloud. And typically in this industry, uh, billing is a separate platform and we integrate to it via integration procedures to show it to agents or um, inside of OM in terms of you know, provisioning the orders. The last two blocks here are what are called um, business applications. So we have enterprise sales management and mobile subscription management. Um, this is basically the B2B version and this is the B2C version. We'll talk about those in a bit more detail later on. Then uh, the, um, the domains that we're serving are B2B, business, B2C consumer, and wholesale. There's something called the industry process library. These are um, different components that you can deploy into your org and use them as an um, accelerator for your implementation. Um, then we have the other Salesforce products like Marketing Cloud for, um, that would be kind of the input that would eventually uh, go into CPQ. 
We have um, B2C Commerce Cloud, where you can integrate um, B2C Commerce to industry CPQ for um, taking in orders. Uh, we have Tableau and Einstein and our partner ecosystem that makes all of this possible for our customers, which would include a lot of you guys. So, um, yeah. All right. So um, from this, I think the key takeaway is you can see that industry CPQ is a lot more than just, uh, or sorry, industry cloud is a lot more than just industry CPQ. Although it's a very important part of it, there's a lot more involved. And then um, this is kind of the journey that a customer would go through from the very beginning of the engagement of that customer with uh, your company or with your client. And then, um, you know, from purchasing the product to uh, getting it installed and services to uh, loyalty for them to do another purchase in the future. I won't go through this in, in significant detail, but uh, industry CPQ plays a role in these pieces. So uh, for digital commerce and omni-channel cart, um, if you're using B2C Commerce Cloud for your digital channel, uh, that could integrate to industry CPQ via the APIs that are available. And if you're using a third-party e-commerce platform, that can similarly integrate via APIs. Or you could expose your uh, omni scripts via omni out on, on the same e-commerce platforms as well. Um, then we have uh, industry CPQ. So this would be for you know agents that are working with your customers, whether B two B or B two C, that are configuring your opportunities, quotes, and orders within Salesforce, and all of that functionality is available by API as well. And uh, digital self service. So let's say you're a telco, you have a mobile app for your customers where they can you know uh, subscribe to Netflix or purchase more data or whatever. That app can uh, leverage the CPQ APIs to, uh, you know, submit an order to, for example, register for subscribe to Netflix. All right, so uh, let's talk about the data model for a bit. So um, in this section, I'll talk about the customer data model because that's one of the key things in industry cloud. Uh, we'll also talk about kind of the sales journey that industry CPQ goes through. We'll understand the different sales related objects there. And the third piece of this is the kind of metadata type objects. So this would cover uh, the objects behind integration procedures, data raptors, et cetera, and also the product catalog. I won't actually cover that last piece on the metadata because the data model is quite complex and it's not really um, that critical for you to know as an architect. Whereas the customer data model and uh, sales, uh, sales related objects are really critical for you to understand because we, you know, those are the objects where we could have LDV, where we need to worry about the org wide defaults, the sharing and visibility and so on. So those are what we'll focus on. So <clears throat> in terms of the customer data model, um, let's go through this. We'll talk through the um, legend first. So in blue here, we have the standard objects. In teal, we have the custom objects. You'll notice that everything here is a standard object. Um, there are more objects involved than what I have um, on the diagram here, but I picked the, the uh, most critical ones. And there are some custom objects involved, but um, again, they're not as critical. So um, let's, let's talk about this piece here. Over here, we have the B2C customer and their services. I'm kind of considering their services as part of the customer because you know, these are the, the services that the customer is using. And then we'll talk about how that would be related to a B2B customer and their services as well. So let's start from the top. Um, uh, we have the account object that will be represented in three different places here. And this is a logical data model, um, not a physical data model. So we have the same object three times here. Um, each of these is a different record type. So we have the consumer account, service account, and billing account as different record types. And over here, you'll notice we have the business account as another record type as well. So the consumer account would represent, um, like, let's take the example of a household of four people. You know, we have um, two parents and then their two children. Uh, that household could be represented as a single consumer account. So this is kind of who owns the, um, who owns the service. And we can think of the service accounts in that same example. Let's say that each of those four people has mobile service. Um, we want to know, you know who is using which services and that is represented by the service account. So you can think of this as you know, who is the user of the service. And then if it's a service that has location, so if it's like you know, fiber internet or cable TV, 
So both of those are tied to a physical location. That location would be stored on the service account here. Then we have the billing account. So let's say in that same example of a family of four, uh, maybe one of the kids is over 18. You know, the parents want to teach them finance, financial responsibility, and they're having them that that uh, child pay for their mobile services, whereas the parents are paying for all of the other three people's um, uh, services themselves. We would have two billing accounts: one billing account for that uh, child over 18, another billing account for the other three people, and then finally the assets would be linked to all of these accounts. So then each uh, asset would have a look up to three different accounts. There would be the service account or who is using that asset, the billing account or who is paying for that asset, and then the consumer account, which is who is, uh, who is the owner of that asset. Um, and finally, the assets themselves, there is a, a self-referential lookup as well, um, where the assets can have a bundle structure. So you could have you know, a mobile bundle where inside of the bundle, you have the SIM card, you have the plan, you have the device, you have whatever value-added services they've subscribed to, like Netflix. That would be represented as like one parent asset, uh, child assets, and then each child asset has a lookup to the parent as well. And uh, you'll notice here that we do not have a, we are not using person accounts. Um, the, you know, this is a B2C context, but we're still not using person accounts. The reason for that is because we need to have these parent account lookups uh, to have this kind of household model. So that's, that's why we're not going for person account here. Um, finally, in the uh, underneath the consumer account, we would have the contacts. So in that example, it would be the four various people here. And then let's say that um, the two parents are working at some business. The, the way that we would represent that is their employers would be represented as a business account. Again, this is a record type of the account. Maybe that business account also has a parent account. So we can uh, represent the hierarchy of accounts there. And then finally, the way we would tie the um, the B2C context of that person to the B2B context is via this account contact relationship. So we can say that you know the, um, the parents are both uh, contacts underneath their B2C consumer account, but then they're also um, under the business accounts here, and then they're related by the account contact relationship, and then the account contact relationship can drive the you know, sharing and visibility so we can grant them access to their assets and other things through that. And then underneath the, bill, the business account, we would have the you know, service accounts, billing accounts, contacts, et cetera, very similar to what we have here. Uh, I just omitted it for clarity, but you can consider you know, basically we have the same diagram down here. So um, that's it on the uh, customer key objects. So you know, the core thing here is that we have the different flavors of account to represent who is using the account, uh, who's paying for the account, and who's owning the account. If you're interested to learn more, um, check out this link here for the uh, full data model. Okay, so let's talk about the sales um, lifecycle key objects as well. So uh, this diagram kind of is the analog to what the Suraj was showing for Revenue Cloud. Again, same, um, same legend. So we have the standard objects, uh, which covers all of the objects here, and then custom objects, which there are none on this diagram. There are actually some custom objects involved, but I omitted them for clarity. Okay, so um, let's start at the bottom here. So on the left-hand side, we have the um, customer. Um, again, for clarity, I'm not showing that whole customer model, but from that last slide, um, imagine all of that is here. Then for B2B, um, for the quoting cycle, typically we would have a lead coming in, maybe for Marketing Cloud. That lead would become an opportunity, which would become a quote. And then that quote would um, become an order when we decide to place the order, and then eventually a contract that would represent um, the, the contract that the customer assigned with the customer. Um, all of the things in this um, dotted box are typically B2B related um, and aren't used in the B2C context, but nothing is stopping you from using those uh, if you have you know, a longer cycle for B2C as well. And then on the B2C side, we typically just have the orders, which is used for order capture. So an order could look something like, you know, this customer wants to purchase a mobile bundle. That mobile bundle has a SIM card, a plan, a phone, um, maybe a Netflix subscription or something like that. So those would be represented as order items underneath 
the order. And then finally, the um, order with its order items are uh, then become the assets. And then this arrow is where the order management um, magic happens. So order management itself has a few objects involved. I omitted them from clarity, but at a high level, you can think that you know to uh, provision the SIM card, maybe we need to ship it to the customer. Same thing for the mobile phone. Um, we also need to activate the service on the SIM card itself. We need to start billing the customer for those services. Uh, order management lets you take those order items, figure out you know, how you need to fulfill each of them, figure out what sequence those actions need to happen in, and then actually fulfill them. And at the very end of the process, we would get assets. So the assets would be, again, that bundle with the child items uh, represented here. And uh, again, unlike Revenue Cloud, um, there is no industry billing. <clears throat> um, so billing is typically just a, another integration as part of OM. Okay, and then the really cool thing is um, because these are services, we care about the life cycle of the service. We often want to renew the service, uh, change it, cancel it, terminate it, whatever. Um, all of that happens via what's called asset to order. So you take your assets, convert them to an order with order items, and then do your changes there, or asset to quote if we're talking about the B2B context. And this is also called MACD or um, move, add, change, disconnect. So um, let's say that we you know, subscribe this mobile bundle. We decide that you know, Netflix is eating too much of our time. We want to cancel Netflix. We would um, do an asset to order on that parent bundle. We would get an, an order with all of those order items on it. We would disconnect that Netflix um, subscription, submit the order to order management. Order management would tell Netflix, hey, please terminate the subscription. Hey, billing, stop billing the customer for this. And then our assets would be updated to reflect that we no longer have Netflix. So um, that's it on the sales lifecycle. Um, again, there is more complexity on the OM side, but we, we won't go into that here. But really, the, the key thing is that we follow you know, all of the uh, sales cloud objects here. Ultimately, the ordering process ends with the assets, and then we can go back through the ordering process again. Uh, another point is that if we have a uh, field service, like we need to dispatch technician to you know, install the fiber internet, um, that could be done with Salesforce field service or um, from a service perspective, if uh, we have a call center, customers can call into the call center and say, hey, my service, um, the quality of my service is bad. Can you please help out? You know, we can create a case under the asset and that would be the <clears throat> Salesforce field service and service cloud uh, data models that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. So nothing really unique there. All right, so that was it on data model. Hopefully that gave you some insights on, you know, what, how, how industry CPQ represents the sales process, the customer and so on. So let's talk about the key features related to CPQ. So CPQ stands for configure price quote. Configuring means that we have uh, products that we're selling. Those products can have a structure with child items. They can have attributes on them, like you know the storage and color of a phone. Um, we can have different pricing related to it, where you know depending on the storage, the price of the phone is different. We can have different rules available, like if you buy a phone, you're recommended to buy a warranty for the phone, that sort of thing. Uh, all of that falls under the configure space. And then there's an out of box UI called the CPQ cart UI, which I'll show a screenshot in a moment. You can use that to do this configuration of opportunity quote in order. And that UI applies for all three of those objects. You can, you can use that UI for all three. Um, or you can use an, a guided selling Omni script to do the configuration for you. So to give an example, let's say for a mobile service, we first want to show the customer, you know, what phones uh, we, we want the customer to pick which phone they want. Then we want to show the customer the plans they can subscribe for, then maybe propose for them to choose additional value added services like, you know, gaming subscription or streaming subscription, and then finally take their payment and submit the order. So we have kind of have like four or five steps happening there. Um, those can be done through guided selling OmniScript where it's walking the user through each of those steps rather than having it as a kind of free form uh, cart uh, UI. And also the digital commerce LWCs, these are LWCs that you can deploy on platform or off platform and we'll talk to the, the APIs as well. <clears throat> 
And we have pricing. So there are a lot of different flavors of pricing um, that are available. To give an example here, let's say that when you subscribe to internet, you need to pay an uh, installation fee. That installation fee is a one-time thing that you pay right away when you subscribe. And then you pay some kind of recurring monthly fee. So there we have kind of two flavors of pricing. The one-time charges that you pay once and that's it. And the recurring charges that you pay you know, each month. Uh, this is one example of you know, again, th these are service-based industries. We typically have these like uh, upfront payments and recurring payments and industry CPQ allows you to do that kind of pricing. There are many other examples, but yeah, just to give some flavor there. <clears throat> then we have quoting. So this is for being able to generate a document. A document could be a DocX, PowerPoint, PDF document. The document could contain, you know, the customer information, the things that they ordered, the amount that they paid. We would generate that as a PDF and then email it to the customer as kind of a receipt of, of their order. So all of that can be done through the quoting phase and uh, these are like CLM functionalities. Um, <clears throat> and finally, we have the sales and service cloud integration. So like I mentioned, the CPQ um, from both the UI and API point of view works with out of box opportunity quote and order objects. So seamless integration to sales and service cloud there. We have industries uh, order management. I talked about this a bit. So basically this allows us to do decomposition fulfillment of our orders. And then finally we end up with assets that we can then do MACD orders on to change those assets. I won't really go into a deeper dive of the CPQ features here. If you're interested, um, check out the video in the enablement. One, one other thing I wanted to show though on CPQ was um, the shopping cart UI. So let me um, show a bigger version of this and talk through it. So this is the shopping cart UI. It's built with um, flex cards and LWCs. So you have the ability to you know, configure additional fields or things that you want to show here, add conditions, add business logic, and so on. On the left hand side, we have the uh, cart UI and you can see the, or sorry, we have the product search um, pane here. Here you can search for various products. You can see what products you're qualified or disqualified for. Um, a disqualified product could be, you know, based on your location, you won't be able to get fiber there because there's just no infrastructure that would show up under disqualified and then qualified are the things that you're um, eligible for. And then here you would see the different, you know, bundles or top level products that you could add to the cart and then add them. Uh, once you add them, you'll see them over here. These are the items that have been added to the cart. Uh, here we'll see a bundle that's collapsed um, and underneath this, there would be some child items. Here we have some phones where it's not a bundle, it's just a, a top level item by itself. And then here we have an expanded um, bundle where we can see the bundle itself and then the, the children. We have the quantities that can be configured here, and then we have the pricing over here. Um, and again, to that example, you know, for the phones, maybe we pay for the phone upfront one time. So you see just the one-time charge here. And then for the services, we pay for them on a recurring basis. Um, so you'll see the recurring charge here. And in this example, we have a uh, installation fee and some other one-time charges that get rolled up to this amount, and then the um, monthly charges that get rolled up here. So the shopping cart UI provides this kind of unguided configuration where um, you know, it will invoke the pricing and the rules, but it's up to the sales rep to figure out you know, what they should propose to the customer. Um, and then all of this uh, CPQ functionality is API driven. So you can build, uh, again, a guided selling omni script if instead of uh, unguided configuration, you want a guided one where you walk your agent or customer through a series of steps and then you fetch the products and pricing based on what's in CPQ. Uh, this UI that I'm showing here applies for the opportunity quote and order objects, so you can use it on all three of those. And the last thing here is the in-flight amendments in MACD. So MACD, we talked about this is how you can change your uh, fulfilled assets. In-flight amendments is, let's say I order fiber today. Uh, it, we need to dispatch technician to install it. The technician is only coming next week. Uh, let's say originally I ordered like one gigabyte per second um, speed and I decided, uh, you know, tomorrow I decided actually I wanted to get two gigabyte per second speed. Uh, we don't want to like cancel the order, uh, refund the customer, have the customer place a new order. It's a lot of hassle. What we would rather want is to be able to just change the um, order since it hasn't been fulfilled yet. 
uh, the way that works is you, you know, have the original order you submitted. Now it's being fulfilled as part of order management, but it hasn't completed its fulfillment because we're waiting on that field technician. We can do what's called a supplemental order where we um, basically clone that order, have a second order, and then on the second order, we do the changes, meaning we change from one gigabyte per second to two, submit that order, and then in, or in order management, the orchestration plan will get updated. It will say, okay, now we need to inform the fulfillment system that, our, um, that they should dispatch a technician to install two gigabyte per second instead of one. Um, that probably has a pricing impact, so we also need to inform billing. Hey, billing, you should charge the customer X dollars instead of Y dollars. Uh, order management will figure out, you know, what's changing uh, and which systems we need to update and handle that for you. So all of that is in flight amendments. And again, the difference between these two is MACD is after it's been fulfilled and we have assets. In-flight amendments is before it's been fulfilled and before uh, assets get created or updated. Okay, <clears throat> on those two business applications, so I mentioned um, enterprise sales management, which is the B2B flavor, and uh, mobile subscription management, which is the B2C flavor. Let me give a bit more context there. Um, the idea behind these is this is kind of a, a pre-built um, implementation that you know covers common B2B or B2C use cases. You can deploy it into your org and then figure out you know what kind of pricing is specific to your customer. I don't know what kind of rules you need to configure. Maybe in your um, specific customer, they have some specific business process where we need to integrate to some government system. You can modify you know, these omniscripts or business processes for your use cases. So the idea is that rather than you know, starting from scratch, you have a good baseline to start from. Um, it also provides support for, uh, for um, ESM. Specifically, it provides support for large enterprise quotes. So let's say a company is purchasing uh, mobile plans and phones for all of their you know, thousands of employees. These large enterprise quotes can have thousands of line items and it will handle that in a performant way. Um, from an OM perspective, it will be able to handle the fulfillment of those as well. Um, there's an out-of-box guided configuration and quoting process. So in the screenshot here, I'll make it a bit bigger. Um, we can see that as part of a B2B quoting process, you know, if you're um, uh, quoting for internet, for example, maybe you want to choose for each of the offices what configuration of internet we want, and then um, be able to see it on the map. Uh, the you know ability to upload the locations, to see them, to choose which ones we want to quote for, all of that is available um, as part of the guided flow. And it covers more than just location, but just to give an example. Um, and finally, there are some reference product models available. So, um, you know, as part of a CBQ project, whether it's Revenue Cloud, whether it's industry CBQ or something else, um, one of the biggest pieces of work is figuring out, you know, what products do you, does the customer sell? How do we want to model them? You know, how are they modeled today? Can we simplify it? That sort of thing. Um, so these are reference product models for common uh, products in these industries, like, you know, business internet, uh, business mobile, that sort of thing. So you have a good starting point to start from rather than starting from scratch. So basically the, the key takeaway here is, you know, you can think of this as an accelerator that gives you a good baseline to start from, and then you um, modify it to your specific needs from there. And then mobile subscription management or MSM is the B2C flavor of this. Um, again, similar idea, basically an accelerator, good starting point to get you started, and then you build on top of it. Uh, so what it provides is an agent council. I'll show you a bigger version of this. Uh, this agent council is using the service council where you can have different tabs um, to make it easy for your um, call center agents or store agents to work with you know, multiple customers. Um, and then inside of the council, a lot of these things are flex cards. So these um, pieces here would be flex cards. And then from the flex cards, you can <laughs> choose an action like a voucher top up and then that would probably invoke an Omniscript that would guide the uh, sales rep through topping up a voucher for the customer um, as part of the Omniscript. And then you can, you know, um, this is all built with the, the Salesforce app builder, so you can drag and drop other components or modify them as you like. Um, and then there are some uh, pre-configured guided Omniscripts for some of these things, like that uh, selling uh, the, the new registration process where you know, a customer chooses their, uh, their mobile phone, their plan, their add-on services. 
um, or like a SIM card replacement, those kind of Omni scripts are um, pre-configured as, as part of this as well. And then there are sample integrations for integrating with common external applications as well. So you know, you'll need to integrate to billing to uh, start charging the customer for the service. There is a reference integration that you can uh, start with there rather than building from scratch. All right, so um, if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, there's a, a nice link in the enablement resources that I'll talk to in a bit. So probably from uh, Suraj's session and from what I just described here, you'll have noticed a lot of uh, commonalities between the two products, but also some differences. So let's talk about that a little bit more. I often get the question, you know, what is the difference between Salesforce CPQ or Revenue Cloud and Industry CPQ or Industry Cloud? Um, to me, they're, you know, it's kind of comparing apples to oranges. So uh, what I did here is I took the uh, product um, product license page from the uh, Salesforce public website. Here we have Revenue Cloud or Salesforce CPQ on the left, and then Industry Cloud, specifically Communication Cloud, on the right. So um, for Salesforce CPQ, we can see that Salesforce CPQ is sold as a standalone application, and you can purchase it you know, without the data model, without Omni Studio, all of that good stuff. Um, and then you can also purchase you know, CPQ plus billing. Uh, on the industry cloud side, you'll notice that uh, there is no option to purchase industry CPQ outside of industry cloud. So really, when you purchase um, Industry, uh, industry CPQ, you're actually purchasing industry cloud, which includes the data model, Omni Studio, CPQ, DocGen, um, OM, these business applications. So, you know, it's, it's apples to oranges. One of them is a, a CPQ application, the other is a full industry cloud. Um, both are CPQ project products, so they support a lot of the common CPQ requirements, like you know, being able to define products and pricing, configuring them at runtime, handling complex pricing, approving quotes, generating documents, contract lifecycle management, order management. Um, specifically for order management, there's industries OM on the industry side, and then advanced OM on the uh, revenue cloud side. Uh, probably we would need another session to deep dive into like the similarities and differences between those um, and both support install based modifications. So we talked about, you know, MACD, uh, MACD orders on industry side and then the uh, revenue cloud equivalent is contract amendments. So both are CPQ pro uh, products, we would expect them to have CPQ features, right? Uh, let's look at a few key differences. So the most important one is which industries they serve. Industry cloud is specifically uh, for communications, media, and energy, if we're talking about you know, what includes uh, industry CPQ. And then revenue cloud covers other industries. So this could be high tech, education, automotive, real estate, professional services, and others. Um, you know, this, if there's like one key difference, it's definitely this one. OK, the, the other things are um, revenue cloud has a billing application, industries does not. Both of them have order management products, although they're a bit different. Um, on the industry side, we have Omni Studio um, that's not there on the revenue cloud side. And then from a data model perspective, you probably noticed it, you know, the biggest difference is that uh, on industries, we use the standard quote object and the whole CPQ is available on opportunity quote and order. On the revenue cloud side, there's a managed quote object and CPQ is available on that managed quote object. Um, and then on the industry side, you know, what are what are the unique things about industry CPQ? So the, the pieces there are the business applications we talked about. Um, all of this is API enabled. So you know, if you're if you have a public website available to your customers and you want that, you want customers to be able to, you know, place orders through that website, uh, you can build you know, an API integration to communications cloud. Or industry CPQ to you know fetch the products, figure out the pricing, submit the order, and so on. Um, there's seamless integrations to uh, industries OM that I talked about. Those MACD and amendment orders. Um, change of plans. So this is if you wanted to upgrade from one plan or downgrade from one plan to another, or you know um, upgrade from mobile only to mobile plus internet. One way of doing this is you could disconnect your existing services, subscribe to the new services. The problem is you would lose your service for some period of time, which we wouldn't want. We would want to continue the service. 
and change of plan lets you, you know, upgrade from one to another. It will carry through um, all of the services. So, you know, it won't disconnect your uh, mobile service when you upgrade to mobile plus internet. And OM will also know that, you know, I shouldn't disconnect this. I should just transfer it to this, this new bundle. And finally, there's uh, multi-site forwarding and ordering. This is for B2B scenarios where uh, rather than juggling like many quotes for many different sites, um, in the UI, you can see uh, all of the quotes together in one place, configure them together without having to, you know, all tap through a lot of different screens and browser windows and so on. Uh, there's a lot more here, but, you know, just to touch on, on a few of them. Okay, so um, the, the core question is, you know, how do we decide between these two products? And ultimately, it's very simple. Basically, the question you need to ask yourself is which industry are you talking about? Um, regardless, you know, talk to your Salesforce account team, they'll help you through this. Um, but really, it comes down to the industry. So um, if it's communication, media, energy, it's industry cloud. If it's one of the other industries, it's revenue cloud. And that's it. It's really that simple. All right, so that was um, all the content we had. Sorry, I had to go a bit quick. Uh, there's just a lot I wanted to cover. And hopefully that give you, gave you a flavor. If you want to dive a bit deeper, check out these resources. So we have the, um, a session I did for Apex Hours intro to Industry CBQ. If you want a deeper dive into Industry CBQ, what it looks like, how to configure it, I do a, a combination of both um, theory slides and live demo. So check that out, it's about an hour and a half. If you're interested in learning more about Industries OM, my colleague Michael Boob did basically a very similar session to what I did on CBQ, but on the OM side. So really great stuff if you want to dive deeper there. If you're interested in getting certified, we have the Industry CPQ Developer, um, Omni Studio Developer, and Omni Studio Consultant. Um, for Omni Studio, that's available on Trailhead. For Industry CPQ Developer, it's on Velocity University. And then there are some other um, certifications that are on the Velocity side, but uh, are not available on Trailhead yet. So those are like industries, order management, insurance, and others. If you're interested in that, check out Velocity University. Um, for more resources on communications cloud, if you have access to the partner community, um, this group has great information on ESM, MSM, new releases. There's some good webinars and stuff. So if you want a deeper dive into ESM, MSM, check that out. And finally, for Velocity Success Community and University, if you don't have access, you can go to this link, put in your name and work email, um, and you'll get access within a few days. All right, so I hope that was useful for you. I hope you learned a lot. I'm really sorry that I wasn't able to join live, um, but hopefully Suraj and Mira are able to address a few questions. If you have anything else, you know, feel free to message me on LinkedIn and I will try to get back to you as fast as I can. So again, hope that was useful for you. Um, and just some final personal advice. If you ever have the opportunity to work on a CPQ project, whether it's industry CPQ, whether it's revenue, revenue cloud, whether it's another product, uh, I would highly recommend it. The really cool thing is you learn a lot about that industry about that customer, how they sell to their, you know, how they sell their products, how they do their pricing, how they fulfill their orders. Um, you go a bit deeper than you would on a, a typical sales or service cloud implementation. So, you know, it's, it's a big challenge, but it's very reward, rewarding and I would highly recommend it. So that's it for today. Thank you for listening. Again, ping me on LinkedIn if you have questions and I will catch you next time. Thank you, cheers. Yeah, thank you so much, Suraj, for sharing that with all. So it was really helpful. Uh, I think it was. It was. I feel. I feel like you know he was actually here live and talking to us. I didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't like a recorded session. So it was. It was yes. Good. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And so uh, I saw something there, Suraj. Like you know, this um, industry CPQ or industry cloud has got a mobile specific version. Uh, I think it is. It. It is, uh, uh, I mean, I don't know if there is an app available specifically for mobile uh, um, or maybe there is, I'm not sure about that. Uh, mm -hmm. I doubt it. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I haven't I heard saw... of it. Okay. In the plans, he was just mentioning we'll be able to 
you know, change the plan for mobile specific to mobile plus in the uh, browser kind of things. So I was wondering, like, if we have good I, separate version. Oh uh, no, I think I think he was referring to uh, you know he was just giving an example. Uh, oh, you know, okay. Where, yeah, of a, of a oh, real okay, scenario. Okay, the product real scenario. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. But it's a good question. I'm I'm not uh, sure about it, but my I think it's not there. Yeah, I just wanted to give an update on that. We don't have any mobile specific app, but we have APIs. Uh, you know, the CPQ APIs and APIs for creating the basket, the order and all those things, which, you know, we can call from the website and then uh, we can okay. create those object records and then we can place the order. So, right. Okay. So sure. we have out of box APIs. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Jay. Jay, Jay. Any other questions? from anyone i guess like uh Gyogi mentioned if there are some additional questions we can reach out to him directly in linkedin also yes okay uh, if nothing else we can conclude the session um okay. so both the recordings will be uploaded to our youtube channel so once it is done i will share the link in both LinkedIn and Twitter. So you can refer that later also. But I would like to uh, sincerely thank Suraj and Georgi for taking their time over a weekend and putting extra effort uh, by Georgi to record this. Uh, it's not easy to spend two hours on a weekend. So I would like to thank all the uh, speakers and attendees also for staying uh, this long time. So wish everyone a happy weekend. Thanks, thanks, Vinod. Thanks to you, Johanna, all of you for uh, giving us the opportunity, and uh, thanks to the uh, the team for listening and and putting up with us for two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank all right. You. Thanks, thanks, everybody. Take care. Take care. Thank you all. Thank Bye. You. Bye. 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 Bye.